really what we've been experiencing is going from a sales, having a, a community of real estate agents helping people transform their homes over time into scale jumping into much larger projects, doing our own projects and putting the learnings together and how that shows up on a spreadsheet and then eventually how it'll show up in the built form. Yeah, and I think the next iteration that's going to come for Latitude is really sinking our teeth into how do we mature the regenerative investing space Mm -hmm. so that we can marry together these purpose-driven impact projects with people that are trying to allocate and invest into projects that are going to be consistent with their values. Love it. Yeah, the quadruple bottom line, as some like to call it. People, planet, profit, and purpose. Purpose. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast, a show about human environments and how they can be used as a force for good. Conversations that educate and inspire people looking for a different way to do real estate. I'm Neil Collins, and on this podcast, I'm joined by Alyssa Collins, my partner and the co-founder of Latitude Regenerative Real Estate. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. We have got a special treat for you today because... This is going to be a different format for the show. You see, the vast majority of episodes, I'm joined by leaders within the regenerative movement, and I have the easy job of listening to their incredible stories of how they are working with land and communities to create resilient and beautiful habitats. In this episode, however, I'm joined by Alyssa, who put me in the interviewee seat We wanted to lift back the curtains about our entrepreneurial process that we've been on growing a regenerative focused real estate brand and how things have evolved over the last four years. This conversation is packed with lessons learned from highs to lows, as well as tipping our hats to the future offerings we have in store at Latitude. If you want to hear more about Alyssa and my 12 year journey working together across the globe and how two climate change adaptation and community development specialists ended up in this crazy industry of investment, development, and real estate, you should tune in to episode 81, where we cover more of our origin story. Before we launch into the show, I want to give a shout out to Latitude's ecosystem directory member, Greywater Action. This organization is a collaborative of educators who teach residents and tradespeople about affordable and simple household water systems that dramatically reduce water use and foster sustainable cultures of water. Through hands-on workshops and presentations, they've led thousands of people through gray water system design and construction, and they work with policymakers and water districts to develop needed codes and incentives for things like gray water, rainwater harvesting, and composting toilets. To learn more about them and the incredible work they are doing, you should visit their website at graywateraction.org. And for the listeners out there that have businesses that are aligned towards our work of regenerative real estate and would like to be included in our ecosystem directory, I encourage you to apply and to share more about your work with us at chooselatitude.com forward slash ecosystem dash directory. It is free to join and a great way to get your brand in front of value-aligned customers. And with that, let's get into this week's episode. Alyssa, welcome to the show. It's fun to have you back here. We did this once before. We gave a great overview of really what our life has been like leading up to this point of trying to put words to this feeling around regenerative real estate and this podcast journey that has been 
an individual act for me as as a practice, but you're very much behind the scenes, not only as a, a cheerleader, so to speak, but as someone that gets to drive my curiosity. And so that's why it's really fun to share the stage with you today and welcome you to the show and and really hand you the the keys to this to this vehicle to see where you want to take things. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you here. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction, Neil. And hello, everybody. It is good to be with you today. I was chatting with Neil earlier this afternoon and actually last week about just some big changes and evolutions that have been going on in our world, both personally and professionally. And it made me think, how fun would it be to ask you a couple questions? Since you've been behind the microphone, since really it was January of 2020, and here we are four years plus a couple months later, and there's some big milestones to celebrate, actually. Yeah, we crossed 100 episodes, Mm -hmm. a couple episodes back, and it's crazy to think that it's been four years now of recording a podcast every other week and putting it out there quite consistently. I'm, I'm proud of myself for that. And thank you for coming on this journey with me because it is, if I would have known how much of a labor of love uh, it it actually is to create this show, I might not have done it, but it, yeah. it is certainly due to your support. Yeah. I've listened to every episode. I'm inspired by you and your guests every single time an episode is released. And you have made a great impact on my life. So that's why I wanted to start out today is like, let's just really celebrate the work and celebrate what it means to be consistent in our practice since so much of this is stepping into the unknown and doing that consistently. So I wanted to take the opportunity today to ask you a couple of questions since you've been guiding the conversation and bringing experts in the field on and practitioners and you know those who are doing the everyday work and those who are leading big organizations. And I wanted to start out by saying, what have you learned in the last four years? That's <clears throat> that's a great question. And and we could take it in a lot of different ways because whenever we came together and I let me just backtrack Mm -hmm. to why I say we because in 2019 it really was you and I going through life changes business changes at the time going into this conversation around what is wellness and what is health and what is genuine wealth There was a lot of chaos going on in our lives, family members getting sick, some with terminal diagnoses, and really being at the helm of a company that did not imbue our values around sustainability and ecology and community. And that's whenever we started to ask this question of what does regenerative real estate look like? And that's really been my learnings over the past four years is that you can actually start with a question. You do not have to start with an answer. But if you you hold the space and you can remain in integrity in that, that process of seeking out those voices, what I found is that the people that are leading this movement of regeneration, they're asking the same questions. They're generative questions. They are not saying, okay, this is exactly what it, what it looks like. They're saying, this is what my passion is. This is how I see the world. This is ways in which I can really iterate. And this is what I'm, what I'm contributing my gifts Mm -hmm. in pursuit of a feeling, a knowing that we can create habitats that are thriving and we can create communities that are strong and, and this is really the, the greater narrative of, or I guess the pattern that I see in everybody's work is that they are taking their experiences that are so authentic and unique to themselves and 
they're internalizing them and they're reflecting upon them and they are infusing that into their businesses and their organizations. And it's creating these really amazing and u- unique circumstances to do things that people have never done before and to innovate in areas that people haven't innovated on before. And that's what I'm learning is that our story is so important to who we are and how we show up in the world and why I'm just so blessed to actually be on this journey with you through thick and thin, high and low. We've charted a pretty unconventional life together Mm -hmm. that's created the conditions for so many different life experiences that come together to try to create something unique, authentic, and impactful in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's like one part reflection, one part in the mix, and then one part emergence. And sometimes I see that as the pie. Like we, we have our life experiences, we go through it, we're able to reflect, and then we're able to emerge, hopefully, from that experience. Well, I, I emerge from an experience like you're going to get through an experience, right? No Even if what. no matter what, right? Um, even the low points, especially if you're on an entrepreneurial journey or you're going through a health scare, like all these things, the adversity that we're encountering are actually really relevant mm-hmm. to how we see the world Mm -hmm. and how we interact with it and what our, our own coping or resilience looks like. And, and so I just, I want people to, to walk away from this conversation, knowing that we've had our fair share of lows that we've had to internalize. The entrepreneurial pursuit is never as easy as social media may portray but that's really where I, I get a lot of inspiration is like taking that adversity from the personal to the meta of the times that we're going through and, and trying to, to work in a, in a way that is going to be additive mm-hmm. to where we're at right now in our culture. Mm-hmm. So what has been enlivening about this work, both the inquiry of what is regenerative real estate and how might that express itself? Or what is enlivening about hosting this podcast? You know, we've really gone through this period over the last four or five years where regeneration was not necessarily a term that people were familiar with. And and we've actually had experience with this before because uh, we met in graduate school in 2011, and I was pursuing a master's degree in sustainable development. And at the time, that word was... I wouldn't say new on the scene, but it was new enough that we were getting a lot of blank stares whenever people would ask, well, what what are you studying? What's your major? And I would say sustainable development. And since then, sustainability like came roaring onto the uh, scene. And especially because we have chosen to be agents of change within the real estate industry, sustainability was starting to be not co-opted, but really incorporated with the ideas of electrification and energy efficiency and electric cars and and like really moving in, in a direction that I think the industry as a whole is going to move to no matter what. And then we started to talk about regeneration. And it was like finding this warm blanket to wrap around myself during a cold winter night because it really hit on these deeper values. Mm-hmm. And what's so fun is that we've had to, to do less educating in the last year or two, where there's more people that have these feelings and knowingness around what regeneration is, mm-hmm. because there's so many people that are now coming into the space. And for the first time, I'm starting to see people really understand that community is the medicine. It is the way that there's so many solutions and so much resilience and so much potential that is embedded within community that it makes our work a lot easier because we get to not only really weave in 
what is community and how do we gather with people, but how do we also create strong communities as we are tasked with developing green fields and brown fields and and using the the built environment to create inclusive community. Mm-hmm. Well, sustainability. That's what I've, that's a big learning that I have been reflecting on is that I need to continue to look within and to heal and to find where I can be an agent of change. What brings me life force and life and life force that way I can show up in my community to do the work. So I, that is where I see the evolution out of sustainability and into regeneration is yes, there's external solutions, but we are all capable of changing, evolving, healing, growing, and doing that in community makes it even better. So there's been a lot that has evolved within Latitude over the last year. And I would say, especially since our 2023 gathering, that was uh, last August, early September, back at the Ecology School at Riverbend Farm. Do you have any reflections from that time and what we've been going through kind of in that fall, winter, and now emerging into spring? Yeah. You know, it it reminds me of a saying from a mentor of ours who's come onto the show and and we've spent a lot of time in their lineage with Bill Reed from the Regenesis group about how regeneration is about living beings co-evolving together. And in business is the same way. Business evolves. It, it has to to stay relevant. It's got to stay profitable. And it's got to maintain its, its vital force. And latitude is actually a holdover from a business that we had before, which was a place-based brokerage out of Portland, Oregon. We just happened to love the name and didn't want to change the brand that much. And so going into 2020 and putting out this message of regenerative real estate and holding that inquiry, the main business driver was sales. But we started to use a playbook from regenerative practitioners of how do we go build the field and how do we find the people that care about the things that we care about? And what was so significant is that we started to really change the type of clientele that we were working with. I came from a development background whenever I got into real estate, but I got to see this, this pivot from working with kind of institutional investment grade real estate to people that have really unique and inspiring homes and properties that were just filled with life. And I was so excited to be part of that that change and really help people call in new stewards for those properties or to work with buyers that are holding this like really precious vision of how they want to live in the world or how they want to operate with within stewarding land and home and community. And that's an amazing run especially whenever you start to call in other real estate professionals that are aligned and they have those similar values and they have this desire to be catalysts within their own communities. And I would say that was going really well until interest rates went from, you know, 3% -hmm. to 8% in a really short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it coincided with a move for us from Portland to Whidbey Island where effectively our sales went from having a good living to zero mm-hmm. and then trying to find that that path of, okay, how do you continue forward regenerative real estate in an economic environment yeah. where sales slows down a lot and realizing that our business is, regardless of trying to be regenerative or not, it is still very much tethered to the transactional nature of the real estate industry as a whole. And fortunately, I guess, out of that traumatic experience of kind of watching our our business take a little bit of a nosedive there, we started to get calls from more people that were, were really tuning into the message. And they're saying... You know, I, 
I don't need to buy or sell a property. I really need help creating a team and raising financing and doing the this totally amazing project that that our community wants. And this goes for private individuals to community organizations to developers. And in finding that, part of our message was working great. The regenerative part, I think people are increasingly coming to the table saying, okay, I, I've i been internalizing this. I'm listening to this. I'm feeling this. Mm-hmm. I want to do something that is in support of regeneration that is life-giving. Now, who are the experts that are out there that can do this? And one of the really unique opportunities that comes with putting out this podcast and trying to to build the field is that we've used a playbook of of building community not even how do we build community but we're building community by gathering people together to really celebrate and innovate what we're talking about and that's shown up as a gathering every single year for the past two years in in Saco, Maine at the Riverbend Farm and that's where we found really kindred spirits that are architects and designers, they're engineers, they're investors, they're developers, not a lot of real estate agents. I mean, some. Yeah. So that's my question. Actually, well, you mentioned it. People are really enlivened or attracted by being a part of the regenerative movement. But then what about the real estate part? How has that shown up for us? And how have we been bolstered by that, by the industry? But how have we also notice where there's big, huge gaping holes and there's not a lot of support from the industry too. Yeah. I I think the big thing for me is that we can talk all day long about ideas in which we can strengthen community and develop ecological resilience and provide more equity and access in projects and, you know, do all these like amazing things in theory. Mm -hmm. But whenever it comes down to the practice A lot of people are getting hung up in certain areas that create bottlenecks that I'm finding that we really need to start attuning to and really embracing. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's part of me that is witnessing people really shy away from these conversations around capital. Mm -hmm. Like, where does the capital come from? But at the same time, they're like, Ooh, I don't know. Capital. That seems kind of like a, a dirty word. Mm-hmm. And this is what what is really lighting my part of the work up, especially within latitude, which is how do we how do we go find that capital or how do we really marry together projects with the right type of capital? Mm-hmm. And this work is really reminiscent of the development work that I was doing whenever I entered into the real estate industry, which was essentially sitting with developers and financiers and architects designing large mixed use commercial buildings. And and what were you doing exactly? Um, I was the financial analyst where I had to build the pro formas. I would say, okay, if we're going to put a hotel on the ground level and there's going to be a couple of different restaurants, then there's going to be condominiums above that. And they all share, you know, a portion of the subterranean parking garage and so my job was to sit with the architects to say, okay, what, what are we going to build and how much is it going to cost to build? And then I'd sit with the developer clients to say, okay, and now how are we going to go fundraise for this? Mm-hmm. And, and it was very much this like give and take and kind of feeling your way through a project and understanding what capital really needs and what it wants and uh, how architecture works and design. And so this is the background that that I'm starting to explore and utilize more Mm -hmm. because really heartfelt values driven people are they're realizing that one real estate no matter how we feel about the industry as a whole is how we navigate through the complexities of stewarding place and land no matter if we want to own a home or live in a home, or if we're trying to create really special places for our kids to learn or for farmers to farm or even wild lands to remain wild. Like this is part of the real estate conversation. Mm -hmm. And to me, 
what I am really noticing is that capital is the lifeblood of this industry. Now, there, there's all different types of capital. I think we can really take the the meta view of, of what capital is. But whenever it comes to financial capital, mm-hmm. it is still a really vital and needed ingredient, no matter if we are talking community land trust, and, and this is a more philanthropic model that is trying to decommodify land and home. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if we're talking grants we need capital and where is it going to come from? Or if we're talking crowdfunding or private equity or venture or, or even person to person lending and partnership, the conversation always comes back to, and how is the capital going to be working? And that's what I took out of the, the last gathering at Riverbend Farm was that it started off several years ago. Of, Wouldn't it be cool if it was those types of conversations And then it matured into, well, how would that look? And then this last year, it was, and here's an example, and here's an example, and here's an example. But the lingering question was still, and now how do you take it from point B to C? Mm -hmm. And where does the capital come from to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the big questions that was alive at the gathering was, well, how does this come to be? In your concluding podcast, live podcast recording with Drew Dumpsch and David Leon on stage was really, really helpful because we got to see a nonprofit and how they've been able to bring forward living buildings, living communities, and be holding really important conversations such as how do we create cultural easements on our land so that way the indigenous community of Maine could have access again. And then David Leon saying we need to normalize the capital conversations within this realm because creating an eco village or an intentional community or however it's going to take form with the people, you still need capital to make it happen. So I feel like that's one of the things that we're here to just chat about is how latitude has evolved and what our learnings are and how the conversation is really orienting towards aligning capital towards projects that can create regenerative outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, just to air some dirty laundry here, it like changing dirty laundry. (laughs) We never have dirty laundry guys. It's having to rechart (laughs) a direction of, of our business to stay relevant and to follow that, that inquiry into now, what does her generative capital look like and where does it come from and who's allocating that capital? Uh, so to, to transition from putting out a message of we're here to help you buy and sell real estate in a purpose driven way to we're here to help support your projects and the buying and the selling. And I think it's a, still a really important job is to be able to tell the story of that place. Mm-hmm. But now we're starting to swim further upstream to say, okay, we're, we're getting called into these projects where people are wanting help putting the teams together and putting the capital stack together and really understanding the process of what a regenerative development is. Mm -hmm. And so that is where we've had to, to make some hard calls about where's the center of our company. Mm -hmm. How do we position the brand? Some of the, the salespeople that have been with the brand are no longer with with the brand. Because what we found is if you're putting out a message and you're trying to be everywhere, you're actually nowhere. Mm-hmm. And so it was the hard part of figuring out well, where is this message really landing? Mm-hmm. What towns and cities and geographies does it really work? And do we have really strong people in those areas? And, and really having to hone in on that in order to fully immerse ourselves in this conversation of working with larger projects, larger community-driven projects, uh, but all of them having these two pillars that I know I've referenced now, but this is new language for me to, to really have a lens of, look, we're going to work on projects that are going to strengthen communities and increase ecological resilience. And if it fits within that, those two buckets, like that's a great 
space for us to play. Mm-hmm. And and it's a pretty big lane, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's where I've really landed at since the gathering of 2023 and the type of clients and the conversations and even the projects that yeah. we're getting involved with are very much grounded within regenerative investing and putting out projects uh, mm-hmm. in that vein. I want to take a quick opportunity before we continue this episode to talk about the work we are doing at Latitude Regenerative Real Estate. We see real estate as a catalyst for regeneration where we can change the way that we inhabit the planet. The hard part, though, is that real estate is complex and it requires specialized knowledge in areas around design and planning, capital and investment, and community engagement and construction. That's why at Latitude, our work goes to serve those that seek to create legacy projects that strengthen communities and develop ecological resilience. If you are needing help putting together a project like this and could use an experienced and dynamic development and sales team, we hope that you'll reach out to us at ChooseLatitude.com. Okay, let's get back into the episode. Yeah, so what are some examples of projects that have come forward since then? Because it felt like a pretty big shift after the gathering, the type of inquiries we were getting on the website. It was no longer really the real estate agent looking to bring regenerative real estate to their communities, but rather developers who were planning new urbanist communities of 500 homes, uh, 200 homes with 45-acre regenerative farm with hospitality And so it just felt like all of a sudden, boom, like the shift was so rapid and so intense and so exciting. Yeah. And I I don't know how much like we create that, that reality. Like I've had this deep intrigue towards not so much the, the community around the golf course, but the community integrated in with a regenerative farm. (laughs) And so naturally, I start talking about that. I'm going and seeking out the experts in that that space. I'm working with these designers that that can really bring bring those designs together. And then I started to get called into a project in particular called Sailor Sea Farms that is in a community uh, called Point Roberts, Washington, that's actually disconnected from the mainland. It's, It's actually south of downtown Vancouver, British Columbia, on the tip of the Tawasan Peninsula. So think like heart of the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest. A client had picked up some land that had not been farmed for probably decades, and there's no other farms in this community. It was called the safest place to weather COVID. And I don't know if that was actually a good thing because it got shut down from the county level and the federal level to the Canadian provincial level and their government. And so... Yeah, didn't emergency ferry service had to get started from Bellingham to serve the community? Yeah, it, I mean, it, that's a big deal. And yeah. so f- for our client, he was really looking at this from, how can I go out and develop a regenerative farm? He was really inspired by some of the people on this podcast and some deep ecological theologians is the best way to put it. And Wendell Berry? Wendell Berry, mm-hmm. exactly, and and I, who doesn't love Wendell Berry? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anyways, that project really started off in in the vision of an agri hood, and what was so unique is the community doesn't have municipal sewer, and it doesn't have the right soil profile for on site septic. And f- for those of you that don't know, septic you need soils that are a certain depth. Uh, so that the water can infiltrate and percolate through the ground. But this property that we started to work with is next to a marina that got dredged years back to allow for deeper hulled ships or or boats to come in. And all that topsoil got placed onto a portion of the farm. So it's got really deep soils that the state of Washington permitted in a drain field that could treat up to 72,000 gallons of wastewater a day. 
and just to give people reference, that that's about 250 homes worth of wastewater allowance that this 10 acre parcel could accommodate as a drain field. But then the project went even further where instead of creating a really large septic system and having all these tanks buried into the ground, our client started to say, well, how do I create the conditions for clean water to come out of the real estate development portion that, that's going to be getting built and finding there's a lot more technology in Europe than there is in the United States to actually treat wastewater on site. Mm. And so through a lot of sleuthing and investigation, what we put together is the ability to treat wastewater on site so that it comes out of this thing called the Busey GT as class B water that you can technically drink, but the state says, look, just use it for agriculture or irrigation. It's even safe to give to livestock. You can put the Busey systems in the buildings and out comes class B water. And we've even designed in urine separation because there's this great book that we've gone through called uh, Eat, Poop, and Die that really talks about the carbon cycle. And it turns out in the, the little town in Vermont that we went to graduate school in, Brattleboro, there is the Rich Earth Institute. And they are all about separating urine from the waste stream so that you can gather fertilizer and you can cut down on the water consumption. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a really long, long story, but it involves a circular design of a sewer system that I just think is so fascinating because now we've got wastewater getting converted into, into actual clean water. And the clean water then is going down and it's hitting the top of the farm It'll go towards the growing of trees, and in between the rows of, of trees is where we're going to be grazing uh, multi-species like sheep and pigs and chickens. And so by the time that any of the water that's coming off of the real estate development from the housing component reaches the drain field, there's probably nothing left, which increases our ability to add more density to the sites where we're trying to create a town center. So this is an example of how does a ecological closed loop system based on regenerative agriculture start to unlock commercial zoning mm -hmm. so that you can actually create a there there of a place. And that project has gone on in, in a couple of different fashions to include different community groups uh, and even working to reclaim an ancient food tradition around reef net fishing, which is working with uh, the Salish Center for Sustainable Fisheries and the uh, indigenous group on, on reclaiming Point Roberts and, and those territorial fishing grounds to catch salmon in a way that, lo and behold, is a lot more sustainable than what we've been doing with trawling and, and other you know, damaging and extractive seafood practices mm -hmm. uh, and building in a cannery so that there can now be a more of a premium seafood line. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it also have tidal lands with it as well? Or is that a separate parcel? Yeah, so that is a separate parcel. But this is, again, the, the fun nature of being able to stack enterprises and understand how, you know, some of these projects that are, some of them are not that linear. It's not like, okay, we're going to go out mm -hmm. and we're going to find this land and we're going to build a multifamily apartment building and we're going to call it good. Mm -hmm. Like that, I wish it was that linear sometimes. But now this work, especially in, in these new lands that we're finding ourselves living, we're becoming much more exposed to the conversations around tide lands and how do you use aquaculture of growing seaweed, of cultivating mussels and oysters and in shellfish and like finding that that conversation is actually connecting in with my original love of the ocean and mm -hmm. and why we worked overseas in the Maldives for so many years is like I just I love this environment and I don't think that people realize that what's happening on the land is actually happening because of the climactic and environmental factors of what's happening in the oceans mm -hmm. and that if we really want to regenerate 
we need to focus on marine restoration and marine re- revitalization just as much as if we're going to go out and reforest the rainforest or plant more trees. And so I really love how that project has come about. I feel like Point Roberts and Salish Sea Farms is such an amazing example of so many different enterprises coming together. What have been some of the challenges when it comes to fundraising? Are the capital markets wanting, you know, that multifamily apartment building in the urban core? Can they handle this level of complexity? Would you mind talking a little bit about where, what you've experienced in that process so far and what, where the opportunities lie? That's a, that's a great question. I think that capital can embrace stacked enterprises and, and like really understanding the goal here is to create a community. It, it's to create a town center. It's, it's to, to really bring a vitalizing force to an area. And what they love, what capital particularly loves, is the story around unlocking latent potential that comes from zoning and it's all arbitrage, right? Like you're, you're realizing that, you know, if you're talking to an investor and you're going out and buying marginal land that hasn't been used as a farm in decades, and it's just sitting there and no one's able to do anything with it, even though it's in great zoning. Is marginal land a technical term or is that something that kind of floats around? I, I knew that might push a button of yours. No, th- I'm talking to like, this is, <laughs> fallow unused land that's not great for farming that's not been being able to get used as uh, habitat for people like it is literally just a big patch of grass uh, with some scrub trees on it or or maybe some blackberry uh, canes that have taken over yeah so i'm talking like land that's not getting used for anything and you're buying it at let's say five thousand dollars an acre and if you're able to do something with it in the investor's eyes and the, the like the investor meets the conventional world of real estate development, now you are adding value there just by connecting this closed loop ecological sewer system. And you're actually able to bring housing and mixed use development to the community where they're looking for that difference in value. They're saying, okay, now this property is worth a hundred thousand dollars an acre rather than five thousand dollars an acre and that's where they're really trying to find the common language because to them they understand that difference and they understand what collateral can look like and they understand what the business is of building homes Mm -hmm. and so no matter if you're going to be approaching a project in a regenerative process the investment world still needs to understand what that is. And they still are wanting data to say, okay, what can the market bear? Mm -hmm. What is the price points? What's the demographic? What's the absorption rate going to be? What are you going to be building? What's the expertise that you have on your team? And they need to be able to see straight through the business model. And I think that's been the biggest learning lesson is having to be dynamic and find the right team members to bring into this. But you've also got to, you got to work with them on like, don't, don't get daunted by the scale of this project. Let's focus on the piece that you can really deliver here and and work with. So, yeah, I, I think that's really where a lot of people I'm finding not, not in this project, but just, you know, in the general space of they want to do a regenerative project or a sustainable project. And they're, they're really embracing this concept of complexity and stacked enterprises. And you really see this in the regenerative agricultural world where they're like, you know, the resilience of this farm comes from the fact that we have pigs and sheep and cows, and we've got all this this polycultural of agriculture operations going on so that if one thing doesn't work over here, like we have 10 other different revenue sources that are going on in the commercial real estate world. Saying that sounds crazy to a lender, an investor, a private equity firm, because capital really wants to settle on the lowest common denominator, which is yield. 
And the industry is used to a very linear process of we're going to build this building Mm -hmm. and it's going to have this use. Mm -hmm. And the most complexity that comes out of that is there's going to be a hotel on these floors and condos on these floors with subterranean parking. And how are we going to figure that out? Mm -hmm. But we can create models for that. And in all this, that I really see the regenerative movement lacking these tools and these sophistications of being able to attract capital and present a really professional plan in front of them that is able to break down these components, not for trying to diminish the inherent beauty of complexity, Mm -hmm. but because you need to get your message across to people that really are trying to de-risk a situation because the lenders are trying to minimize their downside and investors are trying to maximize their upside. And you need to understand how both of those people are thinking whenever they're looking at a project that has got a lot of potential that's coming off of it. Mm. So fun. (laughs) Neil, you were born for this. Oh my gosh. So I know you're going to go into the next project, Marrowstone, in that we've had a chance to also start working on. And I guess this is a chance to introduce it and talk about what is really exciting about this particular project as well and how you're pulling the team together. Yeah, the Marrowstone Inn is this amazing project that I have just fallen in love with. And this Uh, is a personal project or a client project? No, this is a personal project. And it's fun to to also be in that principal role where you can just, I don't know, there's something about the difference between a client project and a personal project where you have this latitude of just completely dreaming and you're not having to think about what, what your client is going to say or, or their particular life circumstances and how that's going to impact it. That is just literally, uh, this immersive process and into my own dreams and inclinations and even with you and, and our partners on it of, of just coming together and, and like envisioning Mm -hmm. what could be at this property and, and why I love going back to internalizing our life experiences and our stories. I am just enchanted with where the mountains meet the sea and everything that, that is going on in the Pacific Northwest and, and, have loved moving to the islands where we get a chance to be in the water and to see the whales and the salmon and all the sea creatures. And now there's this piece of land out there that has historically been a oceanfront lodge and inn that's got these pretty eclectic and unique cabins that are right on the beach. They're overlooking the Olympic mountains They've got a, a beautiful shot of Tahoma or Mount Rainier in Seattle in the, the background, and it's at the gates, really, of the Olympic National Park. And the plan there is to bring this resort back to life. It's, it's fallen into disrepair over the, the years, and now we can actually add a couple more cabins to the property. We can bring the lodge back to life. And what I really like about this this model that we get to play with is around regenerative hospitality and using this business case where there is a velocity of money that is flowing through there mm-hmm. to create these experiences for people to come enjoy the bounty mm-hmm. of the Pacific Northwest. But we get to, to use this hospitality model to create a funding mechanism that can go towards revitalizing the marine environment through mm-hmm. something like a gross sales tax that mm-hmm. you'll see like six senses does this really well in Thailand and the Maldives and where they're operating is that they'll charge guests a surcharge that goes into their sustainability projects in the region. Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing that we get to do here is we get to say, look, you're coming here for this beauty and for this grandeur. Mm-hmm. And we want to create an impact project that's going to go to support that. Mm-hmm. And so it's just a privilege that we get to work with our partner, Nathan Reimer uh, and Daniel Lamparty on this, where they really bring the hospitality operational background 
like you have customer service and hospitality experience out the wazoo that I, I sometimes forget about was that was before our, was my first job, <laughs> welcoming visitors to Anchorage in the log cabin downtown, answering questions, helping them get on their way. I'm really good at that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but then, you know, to have this experience that we shared in India, working out of a boutique hotel the house um, of MG, and then working for several years out of the Maldives and, and our project was based in sponsorship with Conrad Hilton, you know, the luxury brand of, of the Hilton brand. And we get to go visit a lot of incredible hospitality brands that are doing really cool things. And to see that come back into our lives to, to then say, look, we're going to buy this property. It's a legacy property. And then we get to bring this through what we're calling a regenerative process, which is, how do we not only bring our own visions to this, but how do we work with the community around what they're really excited about? And how do we bring back um, representation from the indigenous tribes? Since I can tell you that this is a site that holds a lot of significance with the clam beds and the gooey duck beds. And it, it is the like muscles. and the mussels, like it is the tip of a peninsula where you get the land and 11 acres of tideland. And so I've, I've had a lot of fun connecting in with shellfish farmers, with restoration funds of the Puget Sound, mm -hmm. with community leaders from Port Townsend to Maristone to Chimicum, and like really starting that process of, okay, as we go through 12 to 18 months of construction, how do we really put that community advisory board together? Yeah. And now, before we've really gotten started in that, although we've had some great community meetings, the the question comes back to what's the best way to put the capital stack together for this project? And and that's a whole other endeavor of like, okay, well, we're learning that, you know, if you want to go out and build a La Quinta or a Holiday Inn, there's a lot of debt out there that will will fund your project. But if you want to do this like really high touch, incredible experience based 15 cabin resort with the spa, we haven't mentioned that part yet. There is a spa, the healing component and the, and the sauna is important. Um, but if you want to do something smaller, the debt market out there mm -hmm. is very unique. And that's been an interesting endeavor to go figure out, okay, how do we put that together? And then it's really exposed us to a lot of incredible people that they want to align their portfolios with regenerative outcomes. And they, they like the fact that they're able to know the sponsor team and mm -hmm. to be able to visit the property. Mm -hmm. And this project is in an opportunity zone as well. And so it's, it's like really immersed us into this whole tax loophole that has arguably been called one of the biggest tax benefits of our lifetimes where an investor can defer paying capital gains on something like selling stock or real estate invested into a fund in an opportunity zone designated area. And as long as they've held that property for 10 years, then they, if you go to sell it, it'll step up in basis, meaning that you will have no capital gains tax after that. Mm -hmm. And so that's been an incredible journey to, to really figure that out. We're still in this capital raising, investment raising mode. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, I think that mm -hmm. this is just another example of, of how capital is coming up in our world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really what we've been experiencing is going from a sales having a community of real estate agents helping people transform their homes over time into scale jumping into much larger projects, doing our own projects, representing client interests and putting the learnings together and how that shows up on a spreadsheet and then eventually how it'll show up in the built form. Yeah. And that's a great summation. And it, it's wild because now I find myself doing a lot more performance for mm -hmm. developers and for community developers. 
and figuring out really on paper, like what, what do you need to do to make this align? You know, it's, and, and finding that, that team creation process to be able to go from, I have an idea and here's this little seed and we're going to plant it. And how do we germinate that? And how do we put the team together and how do we put this project together that it's got the right elements that's going to be really attractive towards the right kind of capital. And I think the next iteration that's going to come for Latitude is really sinking our teeth into how do we mature the regenerative capital, regenerative investing space Mm -hmm. so that we can marry together these purpose-driven impact projects with people that are trying to allocate and invest into projects that are going to uh, really serve mm-hmm. life and regeneration and be consistent with their values. Love it. Yeah, the quadruple bottom line, as some like to call it. People, planet, profit. And purpose. Purpose. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, very exciting. And I know that with our partners at Latitude as well, Mark Voss and David Todd, they've got some exciting projects in the works as well. Um, Mark's been really focusing on biodynamic farms and what those transitions will look like here as the Great Wheel continues to turn. David has been doing a lot of active placemaking in his community and charrettes. So I Latitude really is now very much able to be in the capital strategy raise, the placemaking, and what is the and how does biodynamics show up in this? <laughs> that wow. is a that's a whole other amazing podcast. And if <laughs> let's not even ruin it for people. Like if if you're interested in regenerative agriculture, go a little bit deeper down that rabbit hole into biodynamics and you will find just an amazing (laughs) wellspring of inspiration and just uh, reach out to Mark Voss. Yeah. He's my teacher. Mark at (laughs) choose Yeah. So I know that we're, we're touching on the hour mark here, Neil, but what are you reading right now? Oh, you know, (laughs) that's a funny question to ask. I've got so many different books going on right now, but, um, I see you've got Sabine Lichtenfels going in the morning, Sources of Love and Peace. I do, yeah. I I love starting my day with that like soulful reading around who we are and what we're doing on this planet and like love that unites us all. And the other book that I'm trying to read at my lunchtime hour is uh, Rural by Design, Rural by Design, and, and finding this like interesting mixture of finance books with design books with um spiritual spiritual books yeah yeah love it what about you yeah oh i'm reading a really sweet story called the diaries of opal whiteley and if anybody knows about this book please reach out to me i learned about it at a eurythmy performance and if you don't know what eurythmy is Either reach out to Mark, David, Neil, or myself, because that's a special little space on planet Earth, too. But it's about a young, a small girl, age six, who is writing a journal at the turn of the century in logging towns in Oregon. And she could speak to the trees and the animals. And she wrote all about her conversations with them. And I uh, I guess the book is in a museum somewhere because her little sister ripped it up. And then she spent a year pasting like literally puzzle piecing her journal back together and carrying it around with her. So I'm reading that. It's good. So it's fun. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, we're so appreciative and um, we can't wait to continue to build the field and do good work, fun projects. Yeah, I guess um, <laughs> I maybe I've, we've got to do this more often of, of co-host the podcast or maybe you should just run with it the next hundred can be earmarked for Alyssa. (laughs) it sure would take an interesting turn a lot of astrology in there oh by the way happy solar eclipse today (laughs) all right bye everybody
Okay, that is a wrap. Thank you for tuning into the show today. If you got any value out of this conversation, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss future episodes. I can honestly say that these conversations have changed my life, my business, and how I steward my own home. If you want to learn more about our work at Latitude, where we partner with property owners, developers, and stewards to create thriving communities and resilient habitats, then you can find us online at ChooseLatitude.com. Also, if you have a project that you are needing help bringing to life or would like to align your investment portfolio with profitable investment opportunities that benefit communities and the environment, then you can reach out to me directly at neil at choose and we can start a conversation from there. Okay, that's it. Until next time, here's a friendly reminder that the water we drink falls from the heavens. The air we breathe comes from the beautiful symbiotic relationship we have with plants. The food that nourishes our bodies come from the ground we so cavalierly pave over and that we all have a role to play to regenerate this planet.